I'll call the uh, September 18th Town Council meeting back to order. Next item on the agenda. General public comments. General public comments. I just want to say before we start the general public comments that we are in active negotiations with the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the bird and dog issue, um, so we don't have any definite uh, answers to give you on this issue, but we certainly uh, would welcome your comments, whatever they might be. Are you, to, are you going to do the general public comments first, or you would like me to make a motion? Um, yeah, I, think, I don't think a motion is in order at this point. Right. General, general public comments is next. Step right up. You've got three minutes. Give your address. We're going to tell you when the three minutes is up. But again, um, we don't have anything definitive here tonight uh, on an agreement. So. Okay. Thank you. you. Go. Uh, I just want to start by saying, obviously, this issue has been weighing on this council for a while now. And regardless of which way you fall, ultimately. Name and address, please. Uh, Liam Summers, uh, Scarborough. Thank you. I did want to thank you for your service uh, on this issue and hearing both sides. Um, I attended last meeting. Uh, it was the first time I've been involved in this issue. I'm an animal lover and a dog owner. And I wanted to get facts. There's a lot of anecdotal information. And I want facts. I want to understand the issue so I can uh, better educate myself. As I understand it, there have been two plover deaths in the last 11 years. One of them has been positively attributed to a dog, and that was the most recent one. The other was suspected to be a dog. As an animal lover, I'll say that any death of a plover is, uh, is not acceptable, not something that I would advocate for and something I'd certainly want to prevent. However, that doesn't negate the uh, rights and access to that beach for the hundreds and thousands of dog owners who responsibly use the beach to their benefit. Um, you know, we are uh, in a situation where both sides have hard feelings on this, uh, and it's up to this council to take a divided community and provide solutions that will unite them in a common cause. As I said, as an animal lover, I love all animals. My dog, uh, my wife's cats, God love them. Uh, <laughs> Some you, you love more than others, uh, but certainly uh, plovers fall into that realm as well. I grew up in Bar Harbor, Maine. We have a peregrine falcon population that nests in, the, in a very popular hiking trail called the Precipice Mountain. During that nesting period, the park closes Precipice Mountain. They don't close the whole park. So that same scenario could occur here. There are four known nesting populations, four, four actual nesting birds known in the Scarborough beaches. There's one at Pine Point. There are two at Scarborough Beach um, and one at Higgins Beach. During those nesting periods, the location where those birds are nesting can simply be closed off. As a responsible dog owner who uses the beaches, when the plovers are there, I simply go the other way. The beach is very long. There's plenty of room for everybody on that beach. And so I advocate that we take measures that would allow us to share in the solution as opposed to take one side versus the other. I don't want unfettered access for my dog, nor do I need it. But I want some access for myself and my dog and my family. And by restricting that access for the months that the plovers are occupying those beaches, it eliminates the opportunity for people who live in Maine, we know the winters are long, to enjoy those beaches to any great extent. And so I ask the council to use prudence when making their decision in negotiations, and instead of dividing the community. And the gentleman came in and said, we need to educate. We're going to educate these dog owners. And I would say, that's fine. I'm willing to listen. But it works both ways, and that's a two-way street. And I, I would advocate that this, this council looks at both sides and comes to a compromise that we can all embrace. I'm happy to protect the plover, plover population, and I'm happy to help patrol and protect it. Just don't take my ability to be there as well. Thank you. Next, David, address, please. Three minutes. Martin Tripp, Ocean Wood Drive. I don't care about the plovers. I don't care about the dogs. I got a 7.5% tax increase, and I care about that. You people got to stop. You got to stop spending the money. I've been here three years telling you this. On the school budget, when we took this school budget vote, there was a $50,000 was all they were willing to negotiate to come off of a $38 million school budget, and you voted that out. That's not negotiating. 
that's one eighth of one percent was what you were allowing 3,500 or more voters that were against the school budget. You put just enough in there that you could put the budget back to vote. That's terrible. I, I don't believe it, but that's the way I feel about it. You got this one off on the retirement, and the state gives the town $750,000, and you use $500,000 to pay for this year's retirement for the school. Employees, okay. My concern is that the state's going to tell you we're not giving you the $750,000 next year, and we've accepted a $500,000 liability. My math, that's 1.3% increase in the school budget cost just on this one item if the state doesn't come across. And I have every faith in the state that they aren't going to give it to us. I don't know when the Wentworth School starts to be paid down. I don't know if it's being paid down. I'll find out before the next meeting. But we're going to have a $2 million a year liability against $60,000, 30 years worth of liability. Well, $2 million over an $80 million budget, let's say. What is it, 2.5%? I could see 3% budget increase just baked in the cake right now. now. I could be wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that this is consideration, and you've got to start now. Two years ago, the council sat there and said, we've got to act responsibly. We have to change our ways. 3,500 voters couldn't get your attention. I don't know who will, but the only ones that can change it is the voters, and I think you got to stop. There's, there's not a you, you don't produce anything here. The people that make the money and pay the money make it from outside. If the teachers and the rest of them pay taxes, and they do, the only reason they have their job is because the people that are here already are paying their taxes. you got to start to be reasonable with these increases. I don't know what you're doing. I'm sorry, you can go back to what the dog did today. Thank you, Mr. Tripp. Next, name and address, please. Three My minutes. name is Mary Wheeler. I live at 7 Woodrock Drive in Scarborough. I'd like to thank the council for considering our different points of view on the dog issue, and specifically three of you have responded to my email, and I do appreciate that. I understand the need to protect the plovers where and when they are nesting. I would just like to ask the council to please not totally ban dogs on the beaches beginning April 1st during the day. The Fish and Wildlife Service has not asked for this total ban. They recently wrote a letter where they specifically clarified that the service is not asking that dogs be banned from beaches, but rather only that they be leashed from April 1st through August 31st. Under such a restriction, dog owners could continue to walk or run with their dogs on a leash. Dogs are currently banned from the beaches between 9 and 5 during the summer vacation season when people are swimming, picnicking, and sunbathing. I understand and abide by this restriction. However, this is not necessary during the spring months. In April and May, there are only a few people walking or fishing on the beach. I know because I'm there every day after school. I don't know why this extension of the ban was inserted into the revised dog ordinance, but I ask that you please leave the dog ban as it is beginning June 15th, which is when the people are using the beach intensively. A spring daytime ban is not necessary to protect birds, as the Fish and Wildlife Service made clear, if the dogs are leashed in the nesting area. What we need is a reasonable solution that safeguards the birds while still allowing people, including dog owners, to walk on the beach. I'm a school teacher, and the highlight of my days in the spring is walking my two little dogs on Ferry Beach after school while it is still light and warm. I ask you to withdraw the unnecessary daytime ban before June 15th and write the ordinance as the Fish and Wildlife Service has requested with dogs allowed on leashes during nesting season. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Lisa Garman. Uh, 219 East Grand Ave in Old Orchard. 
I was born and raised in Pine Point and played with dogs on the beach my whole life. Um, I remember the, you know, the days when we used to walk through the muck to get over to what is now Pillsbury Shores. And we've never, in my recollection of my life on that beach until recently, ever had a problem with dogs and birds. Um, and uh, I just urge you to allow us to walk dogs on leashes during nesting season. I'm sorry, this is emotional for me. And um, during nesting season and then have supervised play thereafter. And it's very, very important that the newspaper report that um, families and people who aren't dog lovers have during the summer season from nine to five to be on the beach without dogs present because I think that a lot of people who are voting in that, in that uh, uh, newspaper poll really didn't realize that. The facts were not presented clearly and that is very important. We need to have our time too. It's very precious to us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Three minutes. Uh, Katie Foley, 3 Lucky Lane, Scarborough, Maine. Um, the comments are really uh, kind of based around perception. And everything that I, that I do in my life, whether it's in my personal life or my professional life, um, I try to make it a learning experience. And this situation is no different for me. So I just want to talk quickly about um, my learning in this process thus far and possibly my mistake and my mistake in perception. So perception is often the greatest reality that we know. Um, on a beautiful summer day, almost everyone in this room would say that the sky is blue. The sky isn't actually blue. Um, it's actually colorless, and it's a reflection. So um, this week, I, I received an email, and I perceived it to be very provocative. I perceived it to be, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of a spit in my face. And um, I reacted badly to that. Um, so my mistake was I didn't give that person the benefit of the doubt, um, and that may have been wrong. So I'm saying that out loud. Uh, but in the grand scheme of all of this, inquiry and exploration are the tools that I've come to know and use as a student, as a teacher, as a leader. It's what I know. Um, I've done a lot of research and consulted with a lot of experts for, from a variety of fields. Um, and have set myself that personal challenge of challenging my own perception and making sure that I'm not simply casting my own viewpoint on this subject. So uh, I've read all kinds of data from DIW, Audubon, and the Scarborough Police Department data. Um, I've worked really hard to understand all the facets of the, the issues um, and to put myself in, in other shoes uh, to, <coughs> to attempt to see their, their vantage point. Uh, if my desire to get answers and ask those questions comes, offends others or comes across as a threat, I apologize. It's not my intent. Um, it's, but if my questioning of the authority of government agencies uh, is also perceived as a threat, then I don't apologize because I think that's what this country is all about. Um, our, you know, we challenged England to become a, our own country. Uh, if we hadn't questioned their authority, would we have a country? Would women have the right to vote if we didn't question and, and try to seek answers? So um, again, if, if, uh, if I misperceive something, I apologize. It uh, wasn't my intent. Um, I don't speak for any group. There's no, I'm not an elected official of any group. Um, I can tell you that we have met and we're talking and we invited all of you to a meeting. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sure because of schedules, no one was able to attend, but we, we opened that dialogue and hope we can work together for a solution. Um, the, your personal view or stance on this issue doesn't define you as a person, nor does it define me. Um, if you don't believe dogs should be on the beach, that's okay. Um, just asking you to simply take time to review all the data and uh, make a good decision. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Next. Name and address, please. Good evening. Eddie Wooden, 34 Clearwater Drive. 
Thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank the Town Council for your wisdom and your resolve in bringing this to the public. Um, I own two dogs. Nancy walks them on Ferry Beach probably 90% of the days, and so we know quite a bit about it. Um, I have some suggestions and proposals. Um, number one, I am in favor of a dog walking park off Black Point Road on the athletic field currently. Uh, there's one at Memorial Park. Um, during the summer, whether dogs are on the leash or not, they cannot be on the beach from 9 to 5. This would give an opportunity for people to exercise their dogs. It would be a social situation. And a little uh, out there a bit, but even uh, digging some type of water uh, area for them, which then could double as uh, ice skating in the winter. And uh, there has been some positive feedback from dog owners. Um, I think it would serve a good purpose. Uh, to the beach and dogs and plovers, it's really not plovers. It's migratory shorebirds. It's turns, it's lease turns, it's people who are having a nice time on the beach with their families, with dogs running through their, uh, their setting. Nancy and I, we spent a lot of time at Ferry this summer. Sure enough, 503, bang, here comes the family with the dog, right across uh, a young family's beach uh, setup, and it's like oblivious. Um, but I'm suggesting that the attendants who take money be there from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. It's very clear, Nancy's input, mine, what I've observed, many people are not Scarborough residents. They live here, they don't pay taxes, they don't pay a penny, but assuredly they know when it's 9 a.m. and they have to leave, and they know at 5.03 or 5 o'clock. If we had attendants, it would generate additional revenue, and it would cut down, I think, on the dog population probably by 50%. Take that money then and have people of authority create lifeguards. Finn Sprague, Scarborough Beach, they have lifeguards, they're authority. Take this extra revenue, uh, Pine Point, create two towers, create a tower at Ferry Beach, have a lifeguard, you have the revenues, but now there's a sense of authority as well. Um, so I encourage that. Um, you're April 1 start date, uh, yes, the plovers do come back early. Yes, there are four nesting pairs. There were many more nesting pairs. And Mark McCullough, whom I respect, who spoke recently, said, uh, was asked, will leashing dogs make a difference? And he wasn't sure, unequivocally. Unequivocally, it will. I have seen dogs chase piping plovers on Ferry Beach 20 years ago. People didn't care. The woman with the two wire runners, oblivious, Oh, is that my time? I'm getting close. Uh, very quickly, um, I think the, the town could spearhead an effort to bring in volunteers who would then be monitors and people for piping plovers. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wood. Next, name and address, please. Hi, I'm Karen Hamilton from 66 Curtis Farm Road, Buxton. Um, I'm here just to, I haven't been to the other meetings, but I'm here to bring a viewpoint um, from where I sit, and I do only have my own perception. Um, <clears throat> I care about birds, I care about dogs, and I care about people. And what I see, because I'm involved with walking my own animal, is that this is a community of people here. They're involved doing something that's a, a very healing activity. Um, the birds are not safe, but clearly by the fact that 13 people just died in the naval base. People are not safe either. And what I'd like to bring is a perspective of trying to bring a peaceable thinking to this whole thing. We're here as a community. We're here as people. I understand that you said you have a soft spot for the birds. I have a soft spot for all of us. And I don't want to take a hard line on anything other than thinking about what is healing. What is healing to the community? The elderly that are out there with their dogs, this, this causes them to thrive. It causes them to be well. It causes them to enjoy their life. I myself, I had a therapy dog. She's a reading assistance education dog, and she's a highly trained therapy dog. I'm now training another. 
I believe, I'm sorry that some dogs are not under voice control, but you know, the antithesis of that is that some dogs bring specific gifts to many people. I'm sorry that two birds have been killed in a decade, but I'm glad that many people get enjoyment and are healed by this activity that happens at the beaches. I have a nurse friend who works in the oncology unit and she says she goes with her dogs because it, it helps her to be able to pass on what she gets. I'm a board certified holistic nurse. I'm able to pass on in a lot of directions, including we share an environment. I share it with birds, dogs, and people. And I think that what is going on there is a terrible loss if it becomes um, politicized. Uh, I'm all for authority. I'm a, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Um, but I think when we treat people respectfully, they give us back respect. If we treat our animals respectfully, they are more respectful as the creatures that want to please us. Um, as for the birds, they matter. It, it matters what we do with this whole issue because it really reflects how we live as people. And that's, that's what I was hoping to bring. And I actually, to be honest with you, was hoping to change minds and hearts about why, what I had to say here. So thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Julie Hannon. I'm from Mass Road. Um, as much as I'm here to talk about the uh, dog ordinance and the plover ordinance, uh, I, I'm just going to put a shout out here, here, Mr. Tripp. I don't, I don't want to see my taxes raised either. Um, and, and I think we all should be just as concerned as Mr. Tripp if we don't say it uh, quite so eloquently. You know, it, it's, it's an important issue. Um, but with respect to the beaches and uh, canine access, uh, I, I'd like to uh, say one thing about what Mr. Wooden said, which was about having more people at the beaches to kind of patrol the beaches or to you know, uh, allow cars in. I don't think we need to do that. I think if we, if we create a sticker program where everybody at the beach has to have a sticker to be there, we don't need somebody there taking cash. We don't need another employee. Our, our patrol officers can go down and pr periodically check and see that there's a sticker there. And if not, give the person a sticker, give uh, a ticket. I, I think that's the answer to something like that. Um, with respect to dogs on the beach, I use the beach. I don't go near the plover area when, um, when the signs are out. Um, I, I love running. It's the only place we can run our dog, the only place. He, for some reason, we run him anywhere else. He runs off. We take him down to Ferry Beach. He doesn't go near the dunes. He, doesn't, he just walks the beach and, and watches the boats out on the water. It is the only place. Other people may be able to take their dogs to the woods or other places. It is the only place we can take our dogs, so it's very important to us. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit to the ordinance. If the purpose of this change in ordinance is to protect the plover, the change can wait. We're not in a hurry. We've got plenty of time this fall and this winter before we make a decision. I know there's a lot of misinformation out there. I just two days ago, or three days ago, asked somebody that lives in Pine Point what they knew about it because I was seeking information. And what they said is, it's a done deal. The person was there at 10 o'clock in the morning. The person was warned by two or three people that they shouldn't go into this area, and the person gave the person a, a smug remark in return. Now, you've given us no details as to what exchanged but I don't believe that those are accurate details, and you only know that. I don't know that because I don't know the details of it. But that's what a person who lives on Pine Point, who, who knows the area well, knows the citizens well, that's the information that that person had. I would like, you to, I would like to ask you to consider the following before making any decision. I'd like each of you to reflect. Are you confident that you have all the information necessary to make a thoughtful decision? that is considering all of the citizens of Scarborough. Are you confident that the citizens of Scarborough have been informed with accurate information? 
Do you believe that you have allowed sufficient time for discernment? Do you believe that you've allowed citizens sufficient time for discernment? And are you confident that any decision you make will represent the opinions, desires, and rights of the citizens of Scarborough? Because that's who you're representing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Hi, my name is Rob McLaughlin, 29 Vesper Street. I'm a new resident of Scarborough. Um, I just moved here. And I'm living the dream on Higgins Beach with my dog. Um, I'm here today because your proposed changes to the ordinance is really going to impact my everyday life for six months out of the year. And I ask that you really take, as someone, the person before me just eloquently said, please take the time and make sure that you're comfortable, that you're solving the problem. I can tell you in a very short period of time, because I have a dog and I walk the dog, I have, in a, I have become such a sense of community. I have met so many nice people. I've met my neighbors. And that all goes away when we're on a leash, because dogs, you can't socialize. They're twisted like that. And you have to be pretty quick on your feet to get untwisted by a dog leash. And many of the people that I meet are even you know, older than I am. And it's surprisingly how many people there are like me, you know, single or couples whose children have grown and we're living our everyday lives with our dogs. Um, and then there's the practical part of it. You know, where do I take my dog to run if I can't take her to the beach to my neighborhood? I mean, there's talk to a dog park. Uh, do they really exist? So, I, you know, I don't know, but it's a problem, and I've always had the opportunity to have a fenced-in backyard in all my towns that I've lived in, and most people at the beach properties, it's very difficult to fence in your yard. Um, I, for one, even if I wanted to, I don't think I could because I abut the marsh. So, you know, there's a lot of passionate people. There's a lot of people that have given a lot of time and energy to try to educate the general public. And I ask you to take time and consideration before you make this final vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Name and address, please. Elaine Richer, uh, 5 Rates Lane and 28 East Grand Ave. Most of us are here tonight because a dog killed a piping plover. And there is a new ordinance that is being put before us. I'm wondering if we should also be discussing whether we as a town have adequately informed the public of our present law regarding dogs and piping plovers. <coughs> Prior to the incident, there were many people using Pine Point Beach that never heard of a plover or didn't realize there were any on, the, on Pine Point Beach. How many people were aware that all dogs need to be leased at all times, even at 7 a.m. within 150 feet of a nest between April 1st and August 31st? How does one determine 150 feet on the beach with no indication where this starts or ends? After the incident, I went around Pine Point looking for signs that address both of the dog and the plover issues. We have 12 streets and one pedestrian walkway that provides access to the beach from Pine Point Road to the old Orchard Beach line. I found one leash law sign on the pedestrian walkway and another one in one of the streets. There was one piping plover sign on the walkway and information on the kiosk. I also went on the town website, and when I typed in dog leash law, it came back as no results found. Before we have a knee-jerk reaction and change a law that had very little chance of being observed, why don't we look at the present law and the entire situation of the plover in more depth? An ad hoc committee could be formed to look at the aspects of protecting the plover as such as signage, a better uh, volunteer, a volunteer system, a dissemination of information, and definitely a well-thought-out enforcement of the law, which, can, which can, uh, includes a hefty fine. A change in the leash law is no guarantee that the plovers will be safe. There are other predators that are not on leashes, such as cats, raccoons, gulls, and foxes. What also needs to be taken into consideration is that people and dogs are also inhabitants of the natural world. And even though dogs are not on the endangered list, there is a quality of life for these dogs that will end and really can't be replaced by taking them into woods or trails. They enjoy being in the water and socializing with other dogs, which cannot be accomplished by keeping them on a leash 100% of the time. How do we get to this point in this country where we have made the piping plover the king of the beach and the dog public enemy number one? 
There are beaches along the Atlantic coast where the only inhabitants that are allowed on the beach between April and October are the piping plovers. We in Scarborough have to look at the alternative to that kind of insanity and see how we can share the beaches so that there is a benefit to all. Even the federal government can't be adverse to you taking a more in-depth look at the issue. Nothing is going to happen to the plover between now and spring to have you make a decision in haste. We have an opportunity here to work together as a town to make new revisions of the law and not just a band-aid to the problem, but a well-thought-out solution that is both sound and reasonable. Thank you very much. Next, name and address, please. <coughs> So please hold your applause. You're just going to cut down on the amount of time people can speak. So uh, Ron Arbery, Four Bill. That's the other side of the pike. Scarborough. Uh, you do have a tough decision to make, but you're all making six figures doing this work. So <laughs> what can I say? I, I'm a different generation than most of these people. I was born and brought up in a small farm. Uh, we raised the animals. Nothing prettier than a little pig, little cow, little chicken, anything. We fattened them up and we ate them. <coughs> That's the way it was. We ate horse meat in 1943, 44 when the war was on because you got rations for butter, coffee, gas. <coughs> Our parents did. So, and the neighbors ate the horse meat. It's the way it was. They're animals. And that's what I think most people forget. They're not human, they're animals. I had, I've had seven dogs. And I loved every one of them. They were my best friends, as they usually are. They never come in my house. Stayed outside, but I had plenty of land. And when they got older, we'd bring them in. They'd come in. The kids loved them. As far as going to the beach, my wife and I go all summer, 50 years. Kettle Cove, Crescent. Uh, Mrs. Jordan used to have a beach with a dollar. You, you drive in, give her a dollar. And you didn't see many dogs back then, a few. But now it's, uh, now it's gone crazy. This summer, on all the beautiful days, you've got two or 3,000 people on the beach, Labor Day, no dogs, it's beautiful. Nobody's, you see a dog come out on the beach, uh, a week ago Wednesday, that hot day, one, one o'clock some woman brought a dog down, turned it loose. She walked with it, it didn't bother anybody, but people are looking, the dog walks by. They do create, I don't care, 2%, uh, voice control, it's a joke. I go to Sunday's soccer games, Fort William, my granddaughter. Invariably, some old guy will be chasing his dog, getting up off the soccer field. But he keeps, Rover, Rover, come on, Rover, come on. The dog's not listening. He's just running. So, uh, and then they come down at 5 o'clock at night. The wife and I will buy a sandwich. You get down and you sit. In fact, I think you ought to pass a law that each hundred feet on each side of the entrance is for old people because that's where they all gather. But, uh, two weeks ago we were sitting there, people come in, the younger ones, they'll walk up, they hit the sand, the leash comes off, throw a ball, the dog goes, 90 miles an hour. Not all of them, but there's enough of them. They're running all over the beach. Uh, elderly couple sitting there eating a sandwich, Dog comes down, sniffs the back of the chair, walks out front, and you know what he did. Guy comes running up with his green bag, and, geez, excuse me, you know. But I had a baseball bat out of, but different generation. They're animals, and that's where we lose it. Thank you. Three years ago, just one little thing. Three years ago, one we spent $47 million on pets. <clears throat> and I see this at night because I don't sleep much. You're surfing. And you get these little dogs, Willie Nelson, everybody's singing, adopt them. Then you turn it again. <clears throat> and there's a woman with a baby on her back in a dump with a five- and six-year-old kid picking food. The little boy finds a sandwich, looks like a chicken wrap. Sits down, splits it with his sister, and they eat. Forty-nine cents a day, you can feed these kids. Thank we're spending $47 million on pets. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and... Address, please. Uh, Ron Arbery, 32 New World. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Brian Rayback. I'm an environmental lawyer with Pierce Atwood. I'm here representing Dick LaRue, who owns property on Higgins Beach. I wrote to the town manager, and I understand that has been forwarded to the town council by email. 
so I won't repeat all the points that I made, but the, the key point that I really want to make for the council and for the benefit of the public is that the town cannot be held liable for a take here. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I think, is overreaching, and the town shouldn't be forced into taking any action uh, on this ordinance. Now, to be sure, towns can be held liable if they affirmatively authorize conduct that leads to a take under the Endangered Species Act. So in Plymouth, Massachusetts, that town issued permits that affirmatively allowed cars onto the beach. They managed that program. The cars caused problems for plovers, and the town was liable for that. But the courts have drawn a line, however, between rules that affirmatively authorize conduct that causes a take and a town's mere failure to adopt policies that the federal government believes might prevent a taking. So in a case about loggerhead turtles, a county's inadequate lighting ordinance didn't cause a take. The court said the Endangered Species Act does not impose an affirmative, an affirmative obligation on towns to take steps to promote conservation. That's the job of the federal government in this case. To me, this means the town can't be forced here under a notice of violation through the Endangered Species Act to adopt a more restrictive animal control ordinance. Fish and Wildlife has all the authority it needs under federal law to carry out its conservation programs if they choose to. Instead, it seems like they're trying to put that duty onto the town. There's a difference here between power and authority. Fish and Wildlife here is exercising power by trying to get an ordinance it wants from the town. But that doesn't mean Fish and Wildlife has the authority to make it happen. Of course, unless the town pushes back, power and authority are the same thing. I think you should push back. So I'm urging you to decline to adopt the ordinance tonight or at least look at some kind of compromise that everyone can live with. Whether you want to take action is up to you, of course, and that's what all the people who live in the town are here to talk about tonight. My purpose is simply to say I don't think you need to take action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, name and address, please. Kathy Dragoni, 3 Winmore Drive. Um, I, I want to kind of just reiterate some, some uh, sen sentiment that was stated earlier. I don't think there's a person in this room that's not for conservation efforts, uh, preservation of undeveloped land, or protection of endangered species. It's part of who we are as people in Maine. We are out there. We are hikers, runners, hunters, fishermen, campers, and boaters of all kinds. As careful as we try to be, wherever we go, we impact our environment. It's inevitable. Our physical activity will affect flora. Our simple presence will inhibit some species. Is this a reason to stay home? No. We also go to the beach. We are surfers, skin boarders, and teenagers who are most definitely not under voice control. <laughs> and oh yes, then there are the dog people. Strangely, we enjoy the same things that everybody else does. We want to walk, we want to swim, we want to run and enjoy freedom of movement during the kindest uh, months of our main year. Again, all of us go, who go to the beach, we leave an impact, and it's not always going to be a, a positive one. Short of banning all human activity, there is no way to provide absolute protection. Ordinances must be balanced, and they cannot scapegoat any one particular user group. The fact is, dog owners have been focused on as the source of all bad things on our beaches. But when you look at the recorded data back to 1981, not just the past decade, there's only been two t plover takes that are any way possibly linked to, to dogs. Dogs can stress birds. They can cause nest failures. But humans can too. We found this out on Higgins Beach last summer. And uh, other people have mentioned a laundry list of other natural predators that can affect the nest. So can storms and tidal surges. It's also been stated that Scarborough has the least uh, the restrictive ordinance in, in the state of Maine. And that's not true, at least in the case of the southern part of the state. Ogunquit, Kennebunkport, Biddeford, and Wells do have more restrictive ordinances. Kennebunk, Old Orchard, Saco, and South Portland have least, less restrictive. So Scarborough is right in the middle, 
We, in fact, represent the balanced compromise between the need to protect people and the need for access for all users groups. Elimination of any off-leash activity for nearly six months of the year and during the same period when it's actually hospitable to even go into the water is too severe. It's not supported by objective data. Uh, the data documenting the loss of nests from uh, other causes, human activity, natural predation, storm surges, tidal surges, exceeds the documented losses from dogs. What needs to be explored is a greater effort to enforce the current ordinances and educate the public. And you've already heard several possible suggestions. I just would encourage the group to work with the dog owners to come up with a fair and balanced compromise. Thank, Thank you very much. Next, name and address, please. Good evening, Tim Downs, 44 Jones Creek Drive, Scarborough. Uh, I'm going to look at this from a different perspective. Um, it's my understanding that the Army Corps of Engineers has made a decision that we may not be able to get the funding for dredging of the river until we have some sort of an ordinance put in place. Um, uh, it's it's imperative that we get this river dredged. It's been needed to be done for a couple of years. Um, it's my understanding that they will be holding this up if we don't get it done. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of people that depend on this river for a living down there. Uh, there's clammers, there's fishermen, there's pleasure boaters. Uh, it's an economic machine for millions and millions of dollars in the local economy. Um, I would just say that um, at, the, at the last shellfish meeting, we took a vote and we voted 7-0 to encourage the, the council to do whatever is necessary to get the dredging of the river done, even if it means going at an ordinance, putting them on leashes from April 1st through the, through the piping plebis mating season or whatever it is. Um, um, I guess that's really all I want to say, that I encourage you to do whatever you need to do to get the river dredged. It's very important to a lot of people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Next, name and address, please. David Green, 135 Beach Ridge Road. Uh, I'm here to represent the Coastal Waterways and Harbor Advisory Committee. Long name, amazing results. Uh, <laughs> we did not have the ability to take a vote. I personally contacted all the members of the committee um, and we would like to reiterate what Tim Downs just said from the Shellfish Committee, that unfortunately the feds have taken the town's arm and got it right up behind our back. And the harbor needs to get dredged. We're talking about public safety issues for fire and rescue, uh, commercial fishermen, pleasure boats, everything out there is imperative that the harbor get dredged and if we miss the boat here because we can't come up with an ordinance or whatever it's going to take to satisfy the feds and the state then we're doing ourselves a big disservice so I urge you come up with a plan we're not here to tell you what the plan is we need to come up with something so we don't lose the funding to get the harbor dredged thank you Thank you, Mr. Green. Next, anybody else? Yep. Name and address, please. Yes, hi. Uh, Sharma Kibitiski, Black Point Road. Um, up until a few years ago, I lived at Higgins Beach for nine years, and I was uh, used to be a morning walker, um, mostly obviously during the summertime when dogs were off leash. And I've seen it all. Um, I, they. Uh, somebody had erected a big sign right near the piping plovers, right in the middle of the beach, not side two. You had to be blind not to see it. And I can't tell you how many pe people with dogs off leash have gone right by the sign and the dogs were going right through the plover nesting uh, site. Um, but I, I know this is the, the whole. This whole meeting is is uh, is based on the uh, plover issue. But to me, there are many more issues that are at stake here, and that is non-dog owners' enjoyment of the beach. And just like somebody said about elderly people go down there with their dogs and how therapeutic it is, just as many people I've talked to have 
elderly relatives, neighbors, whoever, who will not go to the beach because of, their, of the interactions being with dogs, being knocked down, intimidated, uh, r dogs running at them. <coughs> you don't, when a dog runs at you, I can't tell you how many people say, oh, my dog's fine, he's friendly. I don't know that. And I have had to rescue my little granddaughters right off the beach because the dogs are running pell-mell. They, um, most beachgoers, when the dogs are off leash, they just stroll down the beach and their dogs are go way behind them. They don't know what they're doing. They're doing their business. They're running through the dunes. They're annoying people. It's, um, I, we're not asking for a lot. As, as a summer beachgoer, we have a very short period of time to enjoy the beach. Dog owners have nine or ten months plus in the morning and at night. Um, and we just, we just want them to be on a leash so that we, they know what their dogs are doing. It's, it's common sense and it's long overdue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to mention our public comment, uh, according to our rules, is for 30 minutes and we're double that right now. We're up to an hour. I would like to get everybody to at least say something that, that you're here to do that. I'm okay with that. I think the council's okay with that. I would just ask if you've spoke before, uh, unless you get something new to offer, please uh, yield your time. Let other people speak. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joanne Mahoney, 18 Pillsbury. Um, I would just like to say uh, we all know we have current ordinances in place that we could work with. Um, we could work at having them better enforced, the way they should be enforced, and the way they could be enforced. Um, the summer beachgoers, the dogs are not allowed on the beach currently from 9 to 5, so the dogs shouldn't be running loose through the beachgoers. They should be on a leash from 5 to sunrise. If they're not, they should be, and it should be enforced. The only time with the current ordinances are that the dogs are allowed from sunrise to 9 a.m. off leash, and some of us like that opportunity. I would ask <coughs> um, for this town council to agree to at least work with us, a group, a task force, someone to come up with solutions to work with what we already have in place. We are all for protecting the plovers. Let's work on the plover ordinances and protecting those birds before we change the dog ordinances that we have in place that we are not enforcing. And these ordinances that are in place until this unfortunate incident have been acceptable to most. Maybe not all, but to most. There are solutions that we can do. Let's try to work together to make them work with what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Thank you, Ann Robinson, Portland, Maine. I simply want to um, respond to the concern that was raised a few minutes ago about the dredging issue. And I went back and reviewed the um, recording that you have of the, the last meeting that you held, where the um, official from U.S. Fish and Wildlife stated that um, that department has advised the Army Corps of Engineers that they can go forward. And, and in fact, he said, you know, we fully expect um, them to go forward with it. And I'm all, I also understand that um, Senator Susan Collins' um, staff has been in communication with the Army Corps of Engineers to confirm um, that they would do so and is awaiting that formal response. And so I think that's yet one more reason uh, for the Council to defer any action on the proposed ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next, name and address, please. Margo Hodgkins, 19 King Street, Scarborough. Um, I was going to speak about the dredging as well, just that um, it did come up at the last meeting that the leash law would not hold up the dredging, which was brought forward. Um, I'm also very disappointed and upset with the federal government imposing this fine on the town of Scarborough, which I think is totally unfair, considering we are one of the only um, beach areas in southern Maine that has a, a piping plover ordinance. We have, have land use, we have protected land, yet the payback for doing things and working with the federal government seems to be, well, you didn't do exactly what we want, um, there was a take, and you are responsible for it. So by working with them and putting in ordinances, we're getting fined for it. So to me, that shows other towns in this area 
don't work with them and don't put your ordinances because you will get a fine. As being a property owner on the beach, I really do not want a piping plover ordinance because I do not want to be responsible if a plover is killed on my property. So I would regret to have that. The other thing is I would like an answer as to how can ordinances be put in on private property. Um, the town does not own a great deal of Pine Point Beach. Um, so how can these ordinances be put in? The other question that came up that I had was in 2004, I think we were uh, going against this plover ordinance again or trying to work things out, was I thought it came up that with if a plover has not been spotted or seen nesting on a beach within five years, that the ordinance would not be put in because the birds, the endangered birds were not present. So after five years of them not being present, I believe it was brought up that the ordinance could not be put through. Um, the other point I'm putting up is um, hearing about Mr. Kaufman's article in the paper that he would like to have a no-dog policy during the nesting and migratory migration um, on the beaches and have a leash law put in, just like the Audubon sanctuaries. Our beaches are not Audubon sanctuaries. These are used by the public, and they're used by children and people and families and dogs. The ordinance is being broken all the time with fireworks. Um, we have fireworks going off, we have holes being dug, we have kites being flown. All these ordinances are being broken, yet for one, and I think there is one take of a piping plover. The other take that is being brought up constantly is because they think a dog did it. They're not sure, they're pretty sure, but not possibly sure. I really would like everything to deal with facts and statistics here. There are so many different issues coming in, and the ordinance is, um, a plover ordinance. We are not working with migratory bird ordinance right now. The plovers and um, the plovers leave in August. That's been stated by Audubon at the past two meetings that the plovers are no longer here, that they have left. Um, the USFWS stated that the September 15th deadline exceeds the plover guidelines, which they recommend. We also have the nesting birds that come back when the plovers come back in April most of their nests and just about all of their nests are washed out by high tides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next, name and address, three minutes. Uh, Sue Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. I uh, would like to also ask you to defer the decision upon this and uh, perhaps table it or provide an opportunity to bring the stakeholders together to unite them. Um, I studied biology from the, at the University of Michigan I am also an animal lover and a people lover and an environmental lover, and that is what I've done my whole life. I do care about the birds. I do care about endangered species. I took an endangered species class. I spent money to study it. So I'm supportive of laws that, that, that support it. What I object to is the federal agencies that try to set policies on the environment that are not based on real data. Science is supposed to be evidence-based. Policies that environmental organizations or um, uh, governmental organizations that are not based on evidence, they divide us instead of unite us. And look what we're doing. We're being divided right here. All it does is serve to create more anti-conservation people anti-environmental people. That's what bothers me so much about this. You do not have the evidence before you that supports a stricter leash law. I, unfortunately, a, a clover was killed, but you don't, that's not evidence in 10 years. Zero recorded plovers on Ferry Beach. Zero. Ever. Ever. Zero. You have no data that support a leash law on Ferry Beach. You, you do have evidence that beach raking takes away their food source. You do have that evidence. Are we dealing with beach raking right now? No, we need a comprehensive chance. You've heard from uh, attorneys that have said the dredge is not going to be held up. The dredge is not going to be held up. You've heard from attorneys that have said you're not going to get the fine. So what is all of this about? I want to remind you about balance. <laughs> I've put together a chart that shows all of the beaches. And we have Scarborough Beach. This is the lineal foot of beaches. We have all these different beaches. And then I did the beaches that no dogs are allowed anyway, Western Beach and Scarborough Beach, right there. And this is dogs that are allowed off-leash 
for 12% of the time during the day, 12% during the plover season. That's what's balance. I have a lot of other data. This is a essential habitat data of the Scarborough Marsh. There's over 17.5 miles of perimeter of essential piping plover habitat. You know how much of it protected by the Scarborough Marsh? Five miles of it. That's a one third. We are protecting and we are balancing the protection of these birds. It's true. Dogs can be a problem. They are not the big problem. People are the problem and other things are the problem. But you don't have the evidence here. So I'm asking you please to defer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Thank you. Hold your applause, please. We'll close, close the public hearing, uh, the uh, public comment part of the meeting, and we'll go to the next item, which is? Approval of the September 4th minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Move so approved. Move. There is our omissions. We've seen none. All those in favor? It's a vote. Next item. Adjustments to the agenda. I are there any? No. I don't think so. Next item. Items, uh, treasurer's warrant. We'll do that through the meeting. First order. Order 1361 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604, the Animal Control Ordinance. Council Roy. Yeah. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we pro postpone orders 1361 and 1362 and the public hearings to October 2nd in order to provide additional time for the settlement and negotiations with the USFWS regarding the Endangered Species Notice of Violation. A significant component of the proposed set settlement is the ordinance amendments and we would like the council and the public to review a final settlement agreement and the ordinance amendments concurrently in order to make a fully informed decision. And that's an informed of a motion. That's a second and that's not debatable. All yeah. those in favor of postponing it? One, two, three, four. All opposed? It's a vote. That'll be postponed until our next regular meeting. Next item. Uh, order number 1363 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 1301. The General Assistance Ordinance pursuant to Title 22 of the Main Revised Statute, subsection 43054. Oh, hold on. We're, we're just going to take a break here yeah, for a minute. Yeah, take a break. Point of order. Clear out. Point can't hear. to Title 22 of the Main Revised Statute, Section 43054. This is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Anybody who would like to speak on this 
item. Please step up, give your name and address. Seeing none, seeing none, I'll close public hearing. Next order. Um, wish the council on this. The wishes of the council. I would move approval of order 1363. Second. Any comments? If not, I'll lose it. Just the yep. comment Let's that uh, this is. Uh, what has been handed down to us from the state as guidelines for general assistance, and basically it's just ratification of the states, uh, what they're going to give us. Something we do every year. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Next item. Order number 13-66 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302 of the Town Council Rules and Policies Manual, Section 204.0, Other Committees and Boards. Again, this is something that we do on a regular basis to update things. Tom, do you want to make public I mean, take public hearing? The uh, uh, chairman of the Rules and Policies Committee perhaps could speak to it, but it's a proposed amendment to the rules. I'll make sure I'm looking at the right one. Yep. Yeah, to, uh, to require that boards and committees provide an annual report to the council so you understand the progress being made and uh, perhaps to appreciate uh, uh, whether they're still serving a valuable purpose to the town. Thank you. And this is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Anybody from the public like to speak on this matter? Please step up, state your name and address. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. What's the pleasure of the council? Move the question. Oh. <coughs> Second. Okay, now the question. No, he said move the moved. question. Okay. No. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Order number 1369 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the renewal request for junkyard permits pursuant to the Title 30A of the Maine Revised Statute, Chapter 183. We have Goldstein Steel uh, located at 36 Running Hill Road, uh, Scarborough Auto Parts located at 40 Holmes Road, and Speedway Auto located at 343 Payne Road. This is a public hearing on junkyard permits, Any, and I'll open the public hearing. Anybody from the public would like to speak on this matter? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. That was just a public hearing, right? And the approval. Approval. Council Roy? I move approval of Order 13 69. Second, Second, please. Any questions? Just, it's too bad that, you know, councilors used to have to take a tour of the junkyards, make sure they were all right. Hey. New councilors. I think, as chair, I'll appoint you in um, charge of the tours of the junkyard. What's that? <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a fun Felt day. Felt pretty good. <laughs> Sure it was. All those in favor? Opposed, it's a vote. Next. Under new business is order number 13-70 is, is act to authorize the town manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the town of Scarborough and the Pleasant Hill Woods Homeowners Association concerning improvement and acceptance of fairway drive pursuant to Title 23 of the Maine Revised Statute, subsection 3025, and the requirements of section 4 of the street. Street acceptance ordinance. And I'll turn this over to sure. the town manager. Yeah, I just very quickly, uh, you might notice uh, totally by coincidence this matter and the following matter on your agenda uh, deal with the <coughs> same subject matter. Uh, these are two projects uh, we've been working on and they happen to come together and are ready for your consideration at the same time. But as regards the uh, Pleasant Hill Woods Homeowners Association, I believe we do have representatives here in the back. Uh, essentially, this is a subdivision I believe created back in the late 80s, 87. Um, it, it was always intended to be private roads, and they have been ever since. Uh, there's a homeowners group that's paid for the maintenance and actually has done a very admirable job, I'd say, in terms of keeping up that infrastructure. Uh, but they see the need for obvious reasons, uh, or they're interested in pursuing uh, having the town accept those roads and thereby shedding that responsibility. Uh, the town does have a street acceptance ordinance uh, that lays out, prescribes the standards to which uh, infrastructure must be for the town to consider that in this memorandum of understanding um, lays out essentially the the, the path forward uh, to get us to that point uh, in essence um, in this case because the association has done really such a good job of investing um, the majority of the infrastructure is in first-rate condition uh, there are some things that need to be done and the proposal in this uh, instances for monies to be paid to the town and we would uh, undertake those improvements at our convenience. Um, beyond that, there's provisions for uh, additional 15-foot right-of-way um, that's to be obtained from all the private property owners 
and that's to ensure the town has the legal ability to deal with the open ditching and drainage uh, needs of the subdivision. Uh, and lastly, I should point out one of the two of the unique features of this subdivision, uh, there is an access path uh, that really serves a pretty vital purpose. This path, um, um, I, I forget the name of the subdivision behind it, but there's certainly hundreds of homes behind uh, that the access path serves a, a really valuable purpose for. And lastly, there is a small, what's <coughs> characterized as a detention pond. Essentially, it's a wooded area that's allowed to um, collect and hold water. There's essentially uh, no maintenance associated with this facility whatsoever. So Mike Shaw is here. He's been the chief uh, architect and working with the association to date. And th this agreement will give us all the confidence to take the next step and to actually bring this back to you for final acceptance. So that's a long-winded introduction, but I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Um, before we take action, is there any, anybody from the public who would like to speak on this matter? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the council? Move approval. Second. Any questions? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Order That's number 1371 is act to authorize the town manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the town of Scarborough and Colony Park Homeowners Association, improvement and acceptance of Old Colony Lane and Winding Way pursuant to Title 23 of the Maine Revised Statute, subsection 3025, and the requirements of section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance. I'll turn this over. Again, similarly and totally coincidentally, um, working, we've been working with the Colony Park Homeowners Association. Uh, there are two roads that, uh, in question. One is Winding Way and the other Old old Colony Lane. Mm -hmm. I know there are representatives from the association, association here this evening. Um, as I said earlier, we've had a, a good relationship in, in working through these, um, these issues. One of the unique features is uh, making sure the association had the legal rights to actually offer the road to us and to their credit, they chased down the original developer from the early 70s, believe it or not, and were able to clarify all the legal deeds, which is uh, a feat in and of itself, and I appreciate their efforts in that regard. So again, this paves the path uh, for us, and, and um, so each party, both parties have the comfort that we can move forward. This and the prior matter will come back to you for final acceptance once all the requirements are met. Thank you. Is anybody from the public like to speak on this matter? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the council? Can we move approval? Second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's Thank a vote. Yep. Item 8 is non action item. Item 9, standing uh, committees and reports. Uh, I'm sure there's none, so we probably can move to the next one. Standing committees and reports. Council really Roy, did you have any? I do. Oh. oh. But maybe you can't we can go right over I don't there mind tonight. Froze. Uh, yeah, they just froze. Um, Standing committees. Finance committee met on 723 uh, to begin a process of a a meeting with the major departments of the town, uh, much to what Mr. Tripp spoke to tonight. Um, basically, just to sit down and to workshop and to just have an open dialogue about what it is their department does that's uh, discretionary versus uh, uh, absolutely necessary and, ho and uh, how that can play into the decisions they make as they begin their budget process for the next year, which usually occurs late November, uh, the, the, uh, or probably some people are working on it already, but usually late November the, the various departments uh, get working on their budgets. So we just wanted to have a, a very casual, open communication uh, meeting, um, just to just talk in general about what gets done, how it gets done, and is there a way we can do it better and more economically, et cetera. So we are working on trying to reduce budgets. Uh, so our next meeting is October 1st, and then we'll have one on the 8th, and we get one again on the 22nd, and uh, that's uh, posted. Uh, uh, the, uh, the GP Cog uh, Steering Committee, uh, that meeting's coming up. Uh, it was postponed cause of, uh, till the second. Um, I did attend the SEDCO uh, board meeting on the fifth uh, uh, because Councillor Alcust was uh, out of town, uh, and uh, they basically discussed the annual meeting and uh, uh, 
I can't remember the other things, but um, that th it went well anyway. And then um, Long Range Planning Committee met on the 6th of September, and we talked about some parcels that, if out of the comprehensive plan, parcels of land that their lot was like half R2 and and half um, RF, or there's still some of those out there, and um, uh, the planning department is going to develop some guidelines for that and uh, address them on an individual basis when they come up. Uh, we also talked about um, the Gorm Road area, which encompasses the uh, golf course and uh, some some of the lots across the street. Talking about what uh, potentially could happen in that area where it's not zoned, we talked about it. Um, perhaps mimicking the Running Hill Road uh, area uh, zone that we that we worked on um, last year, or about a year and a half ago. And then also uh, we had a request for a, a change on zone from uh, R2 to TVC in the Dunstan area, and we discussed that issue. And I think, and then there's the PACS policy committee me meeting on the 26th, which I will attend. So Thank you very that's, much, that's Council Holbrook. That's my Holbrook. committee. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Council I knew you'd like that. Uh, I think the only thing I have new to report is that um, the Housing Alliance will be meeting um, the first Thursday of the month. I can't think of the date at the moment. My thing's frozen. Um, but they should have finalized some recommendations um, for the council. There was an issue that was tabled. Um, to them for review about the T&D zone, um, so they're finishing out just some kinks and the recommendations to send back to council. Um, I think that's it for me. How, how about the appointments committee? Do we have some, we have a lot of openings still? For different committees? Is, yes. Or we haven't calls. met. We had executive <laughs> session, but there are yes some some applicants, and yes, we have numerous openings on a wide variety of committees, um, so please do check in with the town website and the clerk's office. Um, I do believe there might even be some planning board vacancies coming yep. coming up, yep. um, but certainly there, there are several openings across the board for folks that are interested. Also Sullivan. Uh, last night we had a um, transportation committee meeting. Uh, we finalized um, some final plans on uh, the Oak Hill intersection as far as uh, making it a little more pedestrian friendly. Um, we've gotten some timelines on the um, Black Point Road sidewalk project, and which are which are we're still waiting to. We, we we're trying to get that out. And find out exactly when they're going to start. Will it um, be this bids, fall? That's we're, we're try yes, it's being this fall. The bids have got to go out, I believe, the 28th of September. They're out. We're waiting for them back. The, I meant back. I'm sorry. Um, for them to come back. Um, get back to where I was. And uh, let's see, I don't think I missed anything else. Um, There's a couple of new subjects that we're um, looking into. Uh, trail connector and um, a possible uh, um, light down to uh, uh, Dunstan and um, I'm trying to think Blue of the road, the old Blue, Blue Point, Point road. One. Yes, and that's basically was the uh, um, gist of the meeting last night. We have a ordinance committee meeting scheduled for the 24th at 5:30. And that will be a discussion on uh, cell phone towers. Great. And yeah. that's going to do it. I just had one more. Energy committee meeting is is tomorrow morning at 7.30 in the manager's conference room. And we'll be talking about the TriGen model and the progress of that project. Good. We'll probably all be there. Councilor St. Clair. No. Councilor Blaise. Uh, Judy's already... Stole your morning. thunder, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. Councilor Benedict. Uh, I am all set. Um, Eco Main board meeting tomorrow. Huh? So I'm on that. <clears throat> uh, town manager's comments? Yes. Um, as you may expect, uh, I've been quite busy working, uh, hopefully, to a settlement that I can bring back to the Town Council and for the public to see regarding the notice of violation the town was served with last year, last year, 
yeah. feels like a year, uh, last week. Seems uh, like the last year, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so that really has consumed a lot of my time and attention. Uh, just to clarify the points uh, that Councillor Sullivan raised, uh, we are currently out to bid for the Black Point Road sidewalk project. Uh, in addition to that project, we're also upgrading pedestrian crossings uh, that's on the Eastern Trail at both Black Point Road and Pine Point Road. These would be uh, um, pedestrian actuated uh, flashers, signals to actually um, give you know, clear and convincing warning to motorists that there's pedestrians looking to cross at those locations. I know that's been um, talked about a lot uh, by this council and really uh, all of you expressed an interest in getting that done. So we're working very, very hard to get that done before the snow flies this year. Uh, just two other quick things I'd mention. Uh, the town is in receipt of a $40,783 dividend check from our workers' comp fund. Uh, that's reflective of our good loss control and a lot of it has to do with the commitment of our safety committee and, and good safe practices which um, produce obviously less, less injury. And lastly, I'm pleased to mention that Ruth Porter, our finance director, has been recognized by the GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, the real um, gold standard, if you will, for excellence in financial reporting, and those are for our financial reports ending last fiscal year. So that's certainly something to be, uh, to be noted. Ruth. Uh, and I'm available for questions if Council has them. Excellent. Council of Comments. Council of St. Clair. None. Council Blaze. None. Council Benedict. Watch this change. Council Roy. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, as I always, I offer <laughs> condolences out to the family and friends uh, of uh, people who have recently passed away that lived in Scarborough. Uh, one is uh, Anne uh, Demetrio. Uh, she lived at Scarborough Terrace. Barbara Williamson. Um, Blaine Robinson. Um, Mary Libby Sawyer Greenleaf, she uh, was living in Falmouth but had lived many years in Scarborough. She had moved to Falmouth with her son. Marion Stevens and then Oscar Tab and Sophie Prentice from the Maine Veterans Home. Um, I, I guess I don't want to make major comments, but I guess I, I would thank everybody that has sent emails, who have called me with this situation, and uh, I just ask the public to bear with us. We are trying to do a thorough job. Uh, I, I just ask that everybody address the issue and not the people, not make false accusations, and uh, try to cut the rug out from under us. We're working hard on it, and we want to get it right, and we want to be transparent. And I think um, by the motion to table tonight or to postpone tonight, that's, that's our effort. We want everybody to have the same information and, and understand uh, the intricacies of the problem. It isn't a simple issue. There are multiple facets to it. So, um, again, thank you to everybody who sent uh, emails. I've tried to answer most of them. Uh, I think I've gotten most of them, and I will continue to do that, um, provided that I have time, which I usually do, because I, I don't work as much as Ron does. No. So, but, but anyway, and I think, you know, all of the things that we've gotten from the folks talk about four, four major components, education, coordinated signage, monitoring, enforcement, and fines. Uh, those are the things that are key to most everything that people have sent us. So keep the cards and letters coming. We're, we're waiting for them. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Holbert. Um, well, I'll just kind of hate going after you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll mix it up next time um, in the future. I just kind of ditto a lot of Judy's comments again. Thank you um, to all the residents, um, you know, all the emails, phone calls, um, people that stop by, people that flag you down, and there's, there's multiple ways that people get in touch with you. Uh, I, I do just want to make sure, um, I know for myself, I won't speak for my fellow counselors, but um, it's a multi, you know, the dogs is a, a multi-dimensional issue. Um, I, again, I have no issue with tabling it tonight. I think that's another piece of the puzzle, but I do just want to remind folks it's not as simple as the plovers um, or turns or this or that. The dogs have been an ongoing issue. Um, that was something that I believe is where the committee started with when, when they first took up dog ordinance. Um, Unfortunately, this has kind of come into play after the fact, but there is still complaints about the dogs. There's the 
pullover factor, there's the dredge factor. There's the, uh, fine, factor. There's the fine factor, which we did get some um, information on um, about courses and options and what are on the table. And holy Moses, it's a lot of money to fight it. <laughs> um, I, I think the term that that was expected as if we were to fight it and, and head all the way up the judicial branch that we were looking at about $200,000. Um, so it's a multi-dimensional problem. Ultimately, um, nobody's going to be happy. That I can promise you, but... Not 100%. Nope. Um, but certainly, you know, I'll do what I feel is in the best interest of the community. It is not just in the best interest of plovers for me. It's not in just the best interest of the dogs. It's what I feel is in the best interest of the community and the community itself. Um, other than that, um, just a friendly reminder, this time of year, I do every year, it is hunting season. It is now officially bow season, so as you are out walking those dogs and maybe the beach or, you know, maybe you don't go to the beach, maybe you go to some of our wooded areas. We have several hundred acres of land in town. You're always more than welcome to take your dogs off leash. There's no rules there yet. But it is hunting season, so don't forget your orange. Thank you, Council Sullivan. Well, um, Council Holbrook pretty much covered what I was going to say, so I won't repeat it again. Um, I just uh, feel that um, I, one thing I don't like is the government being overreaching, mm -hmm. as they are, um, which I feel that they have been. Um, I think there would have <coughs> been... Um, uh, better ways of handling it. However, we're at the place we're at now with a fine and negotiations with the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife. So um, where that's going to take us, I don't know right now, so there's not much I can comment on that part of it. But once again, I uh, think that nowadays our government has become overreaching and at some point it's going to have to stop. So, let's see any of my comments. Thank you. Um, I just want to congratulate Ruth Porter on the award she received. We're all very proud of her and all the staff in this town. I think uh, every year, you know, they they receive awards, and we're very lucky. We have a very talented staff, and we appreciate the work they they do. So, congratulations to her. Um, I, too, read all the emails. I don't respond to them um, as well as other people do, but um, I do want you to know that I do read them. And uh, whether I agree with them or not, I, I certainly take the time to, uh, as I do, to listen to everybody here. So um, as far as the dogs, I, I look forward to the day where we can have multiple dog parks in this town. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of land that we should we should develop into dog parks. It's our land. We should do that, you know. And uh, I think that that would be another maybe compromise, you know, when the beaches are full and busy that people can take their dogs to dog parks. They would appreciate that. We get some wonderful land out there that we own, and certainly the land trust does too. So. With that, uh, Tody, any uh, anything you want to mention uh, uh, about the election? Absentee ballots will be available October 7th, and we did have an adjustment to the ballot. Okay. That's Excuse wonderful. Excuse me, Council Chair. You don't have anything else to share with us tonight. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Tody. Uh, Councilor <laughs> Alquist submitted a letter asking that his name to be withdrawn from the ballot. Thank you. With that, do we have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, <laughs> so Second. Second. And it's a wrap. Thank you.